So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Sabina Pavletta, and I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Karl Schurz House, the German American Institute in Freiburg, Germany, to our online discussion on, on QAnon and co conspiracy theories today. This event is actually the second conversation um, of our series Transatlantic Tuesday, um, in which we talked uh, and will be talking with experts from various fields about current issues concerning the transatlantic relationship. For our kickoff event last Tuesday, for example, we spoke with um, Nobel Prize winner um, in economics, Joseph Stieglitz, and uh, the German Wirtschaftsweise um, Lars Feld about economic and political challenges for the new Biden administrations. If you missed it, um, the talk was recorded and can also be rewatched um, on YouTube um, on our um, channel Karl Schwartz Haus Freiburg. In further conversations, we will talk um, with Professor Sarah Churchwell about the relationship between the concepts of the American dream and America first. We invited Stanford University professor and historian um, Walter Scheidel um, to speak about inequality in reference to the Corona crisis and also former US ambassador to Germany, uh, John B. Emerson to give some inf insights on the power of diplomacy, for example. My colleague Elsa Petzold will share a link with all the upcoming events with you in the chat. So you can just click on that and you will see everything that is going to happen. And if you're interested, you can register just like you registered for this event tonight. So tonight in light of the US elections and a new administration, current events surrounding the storm of the US Capitol, um, which was only two weeks ago, and the still ongoing Corona pandemic and its challenges, we invited two of the most renowned experts in the field of conspiracy theories, um, Professor Michael Butter and Professor Peter Knight, to talk about the role of conspiracy theories and especially the QAnon movement, its development and meaning in the US and how it also managed to um, be embraced by German groups, such as, for example, the Querdenken movement. Um, yeah. Before we start the conversation, I would like to briefly address um, both some technical formalities and um, the time schedule for tonight's event uh, with you. Uh, in the interest of having the best visual experience, I would recommend using the speaker view in your Zoom browser or your Zoom um, window and not the gallery view. Um, this way you will be able um, to see our speakers um, uh, when they speak and not all of the, I don't know, 160 people that are here uh, in our meeting. You can switch the view in the top right corner of your Zoom window. Um, in case you use it in German, I don't know actually what it is in English, it's, uh, you will see um, Ansicht is the name of the icon. In order to guarantee a good audio quality for everyone, um, your microphones will be muted throughout the discussions. However, you can of course ask questions and they can be directed to me, your host, via the chat function. You can access the chat function by clicking the balloon or speech bu bubble icon um, at the bottom of your Zoom window. It is sort of in the middle, um, yeah, in the bottom bar. Uh, please send your questions throughout the conversation. We will collect them and pose them to Professor Butta and Professor Knight at the end of the conversation. Regarding the time schedule, I will shortly introduce our two experts who will then introduce you to the topic and start the conversation. Afterwards, um, there will be about 20 minutes left um, to answer your questions uh, from the chat. Please also note that this event will be recorded. However, your information like your name, um, the video or 
questions will not be visible in the recording, so don't worry. And also questions will be read anonymously. So let's introduce tonight's guests, shall we? So Michael Butta is professor of American literary and cultural history at the University of Tübingen. He is the author of four monographs, um, the most recent one uh, being Nichts ist wie es scheint über Verschwörungstheorien from 2018, a German introduction to conspiracy theories aimed at a general audience. And it is currently translated into uh, English, I believe. Uh, his research interests include the colonial period and the early Republic, the construction of heroes and their cultural functions, the poetics of contemporary TV shows, populism, and of course, conspiracy theories. From 2016 to uh, 2020, he was vice chair of the Cost Action uh, Comparative Analysis of Conspiracy Theories in Europe, uh, which is an EU project which aimed at synthesizing and moving forward the European research on conspiracy theories. Um, and COST stands for uh, the EU Cooperation in Science and Technologies, uh, Technology. Since April 2020, he is principal investigator of the uh, European Research Council funded project Populism and Conspiracy Theory investigating the significance of conspiracy theories for populist movements in Austria, Hungary, Italy, Poland, Brazil, and also the United States. In this project, he focuses on right and left-wing populism uh, during the 2020 presidential election campaigns. So very current also and fitting to tonight. During the summer of 2020, he collaborated with the European Commission, Commission and UNESCO to produce a series of infographics about conspiracy theories. And we can also share a link to those um, later, very interesting. His expertise is frequently sought by media outlets in Germany, Europe, and also North America. Last but not least, he co-edited uh, the Rutledge Handbook uh, of Conspiracy Theories together with our second guest, Professor Peter Knight. Peter Knight is a professor of American studies at the University of Manchester uh, in UK, where he is also currently chair of the Department of English Literature, American Studies and Creative Writing. He is also currently in the Netherlands. Um, like Professor Butta, he is an internationally renowned expert on conspiracy theories and author and editor of several publications in the field, such as um, Conspiracy Culture from the Kennedy Assassination to the X-Files from 2000 or the Kennedy Assassination from 2007. And as mentioned before, he's also the co-editor of the Rutledge Handbook of Conspiracy Theories. Until 2020, he was chair of the aforementioned Cost Action Comparative Analysis of Conspiracy Theories in Europe. He currently leads the project Infodemic combat Combating COVID-19 Conspiracy Theories. This project studies conspiracy theories as a particularly seductive kind of misinformation seeking to understand how and why conspiracy narratives circulate in different platforms and online spaces during the crisis. The project also assesses the effectiveness of the very varying interventions by social media companies, which is not only interested with interesting with regard to Corona, but also with the um, permanent suspension of Donald Trump's Twitter account, um, as well as those of a number of QAnon supporters, um, which, we'll hear, which we will hear about um, later. So welcome, Michael Butta and Peter Knight. It is a pleasure to have you. Uh, thank you for being here. And uh, I hand over to you now, Professor Butta. 
Okay, thank you, Sabina, so much for inviting us and thanks everybody for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure for me in particular to be back in Freiburg, even if only in a virtual fashion. And when um, you all just entered the rooms, I saw so many names of former colleagues and students and um, it's great to uh, know that you're here. Um, it's probably time now to uh, reveal the real reason why we're here tonight, Peter. And uh, that is that this is our 10 year anniversary. Were you aware of that? Um, how did that slip my mind, Michael? Yes, I know, but I know how you are. I, I don't hold it against you. Because we actually met in Freiburg roughly about 10 years ago when I hosted a conference there on conspiracy theories in the United States and the Middle East, which took place at Frias from January 13 to 15, 2011. So it's really 10 years now. And um, I didn't invite Peter to this conference because um, um, after much discussion, we settled on somebody else for a keynote to cover the US part. And I thought he's far too important uh, to be just invited as a panelist. So what he did is he invited himself. And um, at the end of this very long first day, um, when we were leaving um, the building and we're heading towards Schlappen, he said, let me buy you a beer. And uh, that was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. I'm beginning with this episode because I remember that I think I gave my very first interviews about conspiracy theories uh, in the days before that conference. And uh, I think there were two or three. And I thought, well, that's really a lot of uh, media attention. Well, um, this week, I think I've already turned down half a dozen interview requests and I've given three or four because um, things have changed so much over the past 10 years. So um, in 2011, when I was asked about American conspiracy theories, I was always asked, well, why do Americans believe so much in conspiracy theories? And the implication always was, we in Europe, we don't do that. And especially we Germans, we don't do that. And um, so it was a matter of curiosity. It was something that was really far away. Well, there were 9-11 conspiracy theories and people also talked about the Arab world, but it was other people believing conspiracy theories. And um, more a matter of fascination than a matter of concern. So uh, the idea that there are secret forces uh, see, uh, manipulating events to, re uh, to reach um, uh, sinister goals was really far from well, at least journalists' minds. We know today, of course, that there were already at this time a considerable number of people in Germany believing in conspiracy theories, as in other parts of Europe, but, but it wasn't, wasn't really part of public discourse. And over the past 10 years, this has really uh, changed, and the concern about conspiracy theories, in a way, has uh, grown all the time. I also remember Peter and me sitting here in Tübingen early in 2015, writing the application for the cost action that you mentioned. And we said, well, we have to submit it now because people are now talking about conspiracy theories and maybe a year from now, nobody will be interested in this topic anymore. There you see uh, the level of expertise that we possess that we didn't really predict Brexit and Trump and all uh, these other things that have triggered so many conspiracy theories. So here we are now, everybody, by now knows um, what conspiracy theories are. Everybody knows well that they are a matter of concern for reasons that we will surely touch upon. And um, the public discourse has changed completely. And uh, to get us into our discussion, um, let me just all remind you of the, the cover of Der Spiegel from last year, where they uh, basically introduced the QAnon conspiracy theory to their readers on the cover, declaring that this was the most dangerous cult in the world. And of course, a couple of months earlier, hardly anybody in Germany had ever heard of QAnon. And suddenly it was a matter of public concern taken up by the most important political weekly in the country. So something definitely happened there. Begging the question, of course, what actually is QAnon? And this would be my first question to you, Peter. What, what is QAnon? What, what does this conspiracy theory claim and where does it come from? So thank you, Michael. And thank you, Sabina, for, for inviting me. So QAnon first emerged in October 2017 
on the message board 4chan. It later migrated to other obscure message boards, uh, 8chan and Meikun. Um, and at its heart is uh, seemingly bizarre, but increasingly influential narrative that there is a vast deep state conspiracy involving elites, both within the government and in the Democrat Party, and also involving celebrities. And what they have in common is that they worship Satan, they are paedophiles, and they murder children in order to harvest their adrenochrome, some supposed chemical. Um, and the theory um, says that this conspiracy is trying to undermine Trump, but luckily there is a counter force um, led by this mysterious supposed intelligence officer Q, someone who has Q level clearance. It turns out Q level clearance is really not that interesting or fascinating. It's people who work within the nuclear uh, in industry have um, Q level clearance. So it's not even kind of, you know, major government inside secrets. But Q, along with the Q team, are going to, um, in conjunction with Trump, round up all of these traitors in um, uh, a kind of vast apocalyptic event that is um, called the storm. And the storm is meant to happen, well, possibly within the next 24 hours. Time is running out as far as the QAnon supporters are concerned. And the uh, what will happen is that all of these traitors in this kind of vast cabal, this vast conspiracy will be rounded up, the martial law will be instituted, and there will be these uh, um, military tribunals in which all of these traitors are tried and detained in Guantanamo Bay and executed. So that's the basic uh, idea behind the conspiracy theory. But um, it's related to a number of other conspiracy theories. So I think it has quite long and interesting roots. But one of the um, kind of challenging and puzzling things about Q, QAnon, as a phenomenon, is how it goes from this really quite obscure, racist, anti-Semitic, homophobic, anti-feminist, and often quite puerile chat room um, 4chan to becoming reasonably well known and certainly influential in terms of the harm that it's caused. So, so Michael, for the, the question back to you would be, well, so how, how and why does QAnon become widespread? How does it, you know, what, what, what's so appealing about it? And what are the mechanisms by which it spreads beyond that initial quite limited arena? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a tough question. Um, and I think we have to distinguish here between uh, QAnon um, before Corona and since Corona, I think. Uh, because it seems to me that before Corona, um, it's QAnon isn't really a typical conspiracy theory because um, usually conspiracy theorists are all concerned with um, um, unveiling the secret plot that is going on and they have to alert the public to actually take action. There is something horrible going on and we need to act. Whereas of course QAnon uh, claims um, you can lean back and just uh, figure out how we are going to take care of that because uh, there are powerful people already fighting against the conspiracy theories 
So it becomes more like a spectator sport where you try to read the tactics of those um, um, playing the game for you. And my impression was it, this arrived in Germany fairly early. I mean, you said it's October 2017 that it emerges and um, you could trace this through um, German conspiracy websites already in early 2018. Um, and it seemed to me that it was um, that its major function back then was to um, actually keep conspiracist Trump supporters at bay because now he was in power and uh, so cons uh, the conspiracy theorists might start to wonder why is he not acting against the deep state? Why is he not really draining the swamp? Why has Hillary Clinton not been arrested? So it seemed to me that the function of the QAnon conspiracy theory at that time was to tell people, well, actually, relax, it is going to happen and it is going to happen soon. But then, of course, the, the two, the two um, yeah. kind of QAnon slogans are trust the plan mm. and buckle up and enjoy the show so it's the idea you're right it's a it's a spectator sport although there's a mm. lot of kind of participatory elements that it's all about decoding these clues left by q but i think you're right in the sense that it's very much about um watching whatever is meant to happen unfold but always the idea that the plan is in the future, um, whatever is happening uh, is happening for a reason, but we, the ordinary people at the moment, don't know what it is. So, you know, Trump knows, Q knows, but uh, we, we ordinary people don't. And then my impression is, but um, you're really the expert on that then, um, is that it really changes with the beginning of the coronavirus crisis. It seems to become more alarmist in tone because now suddenly you have to do something in order to support Trump. It's, uh, and at the same time, it uh, really spreads uh, beyond this uh, rather narrow uh, circle in which it is known before that. Yeah, I'm, I might place the, the moment slightly earlier. Mm -hmm. And I think um, certainly in the States, it's connected with um, a number of mass shootings where when they investigated the browser history of these various mass shooters, the thing that they found in common again and again was that they had um, gone down the rabbit hole of conspiracy theories online. In most cases, anti-Semitic, anti-immigrant, racist conspiracy theories like um, the Great Replacement Theory. But also in a lot of cases, they were involved with, uh, or certainly had an interest in QAnon conspiracy theories. And that's why in the US, some of the platforms like YouTube were beginning uh, to become concerned or suddenly felt the pressure from um, negative publicity about the dangers of conspiracy theories as a form of radicalization. And I think um, perhaps even earlier than the corona crisis, people were beginning to look at um, QAnon and feel that it could lead to quite harmful things. But, um, but I reckon you're right that in some ways it only becomes uh, of more general concern and perhaps more popular, more widespread with the corona crisis. Yeah, I, th I mean, in Germany, and we can talk about this a little bit later, I think this is definitely the case that uh, people begin to um, realize what's going on there only with the corona crisis and with uh, the corona demonstrations picking up on that but i mean we've talked about um the harmful effects in a way already that of course and this is something we know very well that conspiracy theories can lead to radicalization and can be a catalyst for violence because people feel um compelled to pick up arms in order to interfere in this struggle that they think is uh going on uh, in front of them. But um, when we're talking about um, this conspiracy theory leaving the confines of obscure forums and people becoming aware of it, um, can we say how many people actually believe this in the United States? How popular yeah, is so, it? Um, so when, when it's on 4chan in the early days oh. in uh, 2017, early 2018, incredibly small numbers um, just in the kind of uh, thousands, tens of thousands at most, but quickly um, it's picked up 
by conspiracy theorists um, with YouTube channels who then actively promote the QAnon conspiracy theory. Um, and that's when it begins to get um, wider traction. But opinion polls are quite interesting. They, they've shown consistently over the last couple of years and in the US, certainly uh, the case I know best, um, in terms of kind of committed QAnon believers, probably about 5%, um, maybe 10% if we include people who sort of believe, but are, may, are not kind of absolutely hardcore. So in that sense, it's comparatively uh, narrow compared to other conspiracy theories. For example, even taking um, uh, Corona, about 25% of people believe in one or more conspiracy theories about um, Corona. Or if we look at something like the Kennedy assassination, which is generally being mm. kind of at least 50% of the US population. However, I, I think we can also um, look at the, the statistics in a slightly different way, which is if you ask, for example, um, the question, do you believe that there is a, a vast conspiracy of paedophiles involving leading members of the Democrat Party? Well, Trump supporters um, have tended to s about 50% of Trump supporters have agreed with that statement. So they might not directly recognize or be familiar with all of the ins and outs of um, um, QAnon uh, as it's appeared online, but some of the kind of the broader patterns of belief, I think are more widespread, certainly amongst Trump believers. And if you then look at something like um, the conspiracy theories that the US election was stolen, that's a separate conspiracy theory and can be believed in people who have nothing uh, to do with QAnon, who might even be opposed to, to QAnon. But I think there is a close connection between the two because they both basically rely on the idea that there is some kind of deep state conspiracy that has always been trying to undermine Trump and that actually the democratic process is fundamentally uh, flawed and therefore, you know, politics is bankrupt. And that's the appeal of, of populist politics, the idea that um, electoral um, um, politics are, are no longer worth pursuing. Instead, we need more kind of direct forms of engagement between politicians and the people. And so when you look at the opinion polls around the conspiracy theories about the US election, um, something like 75% um, of Trump supporters believe that the, uh, the election was, was stolen. So Although in narrow terms, QAnon belief is quite uh, limited, I think the way it underpins or is connected to a set of other intersecting conspiracy beliefs um, is, is far more significant. But, but, but what about in, in Germany? I'm, I'm not sure what the figures are. Uh, there. Well, there are no polls in Germany yet when it comes to QAnon, um, but my estimate would be considerably lower than 1%. So this is really um, a fringe thing that is highly visible. And because, I mean, we only have a couple of uh, thousand people walking through the streets demonstrating against uh, uh, the Corona measures um, and they're visible there and people worry about it. But I think it's really, really a fringe. I mean, the th interesting thing about Germany is that we have a couple of polls, uh, good polls now uh, that um, measure the general belief in conspiracy theories. and. Um, I was very happy about these polls because I uh, said as early as May, I don't think that the number of people believing conspiracy theories is growing and it actually isn't. We know that now. So there's roughly one third of Germans that is uh, open to conspiracy theories and then people who really buy into them, that's about 10%. And this was the same before the crisis and it's still the same there. The Konrad Adenauer Foundation did a poll in 
February and March, and then they followed up on that at the end of the year. And uh, the numbers actually seem to have gone down a little bit. Um, what has happened, of course, in Germany is that um, the people who already tended to believe in conspiracy theories now believe in them even more. And I think that makes these conspiracy theories more visible in Germany because people are more outspoken about them and uh, they position themselves more clearly. Um, Roland Imhoff, one of our colleagues from the Cost Network, a psychologist at Mainz, always made this point that we should not imagine belief in conspiracy theories as being either on or off, but it's a gradual thing. And if we have a poll where you don't believe in conspiracy theories at all and one where you believe in them completely, uh, many people in Germany Germany over the past year have moved a couple of levels more towards the uh, conspiracy theory poll. And um, the corona demonstrators have embraced QAnon, I think, for two reasons. And uh, one reason is that um, Q, of course, claims that corona is a hoax, which is the most dominant uh, conspiracy theory about corona in Germany. So the idea that it's a bioweapon is not really popular in Germany. And the other is that um, the, um, the protesters uh, have focused strategically in recent months a lot on uh, how children are allegedly suffering from having to wear masks. And because they've, they've kind of realized that the mask is nice as a symbol to um, signify the oppression of the state that they're suffering from and the dictatorship that is beginning again in Germany, but that if you're a healthy adult, uh, having to wear a mask is maybe not so bad. So they're focusing on the plight of children. And I think there they then see the um, opportunity to all um, 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 move it a further notch or two uh, by drawing on not only um, accusing elites of um, well, of having making children wear masks, but actually uh, sexually violating them and murdering them and drinking and drinking their blood. So in Germany, this is really um, a fringe, uh, a fringe thing, and it's not really politically um, influential, unlike the US. And I think this is where we really see to return to populist politics, um, how things have changed with regard to conspiracy theories in, um, in the past decade. So I remember writing the conclusion to um, to my first book on conspiracy theories, where I traced the history and uh, at the for the conclusion, I looked at both of conspiracy theories and how Republican uh, politicians or candidates for office positioned themselves towards that conspiracy theory. And what was striking is that they didn't really uh, disown the conspiracy theory, but they did not want to be caught on record uh, approving of it, uh, which is, of course, completely different to how certain candidates have behaved with regard to the QAnon conspiracy theory. Theory. So um, maybe you can say a little more about that. Yes, you know, um, most prominently is Marjorie Taylor Greene, the Republican um, uh, Congresswoman who was elected unopposed because there was no other uh, Republican candidate standing. And um, she is an out and out QAnon conspiracy theorist, doesn't hide it, is proud um, the, that she is. And what she taps into is, I think, you know, kind of a number of concerns that are actually widespread and popular in the US. So part of it is the gun culture, uh, that kind of strong libertarian um, Second Amendment sense that, you know, I am a sovereign individual and the federal government should have a, no control over uh, my, my life and particularly my right to bear arms. But she's also, I think, speaking to one of the reasons that QAnon spread from that kind of initial, often kind of, you know, neo-Nazi or kind of far right wing culture on 4chan. And that's the, the way that QAnon um, increasingly began to uh, get taken up by women. Um, who um, were interested in the idea that um, there is, you know, that um, uh, we need to protect the children. And in fact, um, in both in the US and the UK, um, over last summer with the 
uh, various lockdown, anti-lockdown protests, the QAnon supporters took over the hashtag from an international charity called Save the Children. Um, and they were increasingly framing QAnon as this um, benevolent effort to try and stop child trafficking. Um, now, child trafficking is no doubt real, but is not a significantly huge problem, certainly not in the numbers that QAnon supporters have been suggesting. But someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene is speaking to that audience that's now known as pastel Q, the idea of this kind of Instagram, female friendly, uh, non-threatening, non kind of obviously neo-Nazi form of um, QAnon belief. That is, um, you know, sometimes I'm quite cynical about conspiracy theories and I think people are, don't really believe what they're saying and they're just doing it for kind of, you know, online posturing. And certainly that was the case with QAnon at the outset. I mean, QAnon comes out of a culture of uh, what's called LARPing, uh, live action role playing. And QAnon, you know, was this person pretending to be uh, a secret government insider and 4chan was full of people posing like that. It was part of the game playing to try and get people to believe that. But um, with QAnon and the pastelization of, of QAnon, mm. I think there are now a lot of really genuine, sincere believers who feel that they are doing uh, important work to try and um, tackle child trafficking. And often they are passionate in their beliefs and their beliefs are often in the US certainly connected with evangelical forms of Christianity. And I think it's that convergence between evangelicalism, um, gun rights, um, libertarianism and the alternative health movement that you get with the corona uh, crisis protests, the convergence of those different and often quite kind of opposing groups um, has made QAnon, I think, quite an important force in the US in a way that perhaps um, it is not the same in Germany. Yeah, this is um, uh, this is really interesting, the way uh, QAnon is now appealing to women, because I mean, um, if there's one thing we know about conspiracy theories and the two of us, we knew that uh, for a long time, but by now also our colleagues working with quantitative methods um, are confirming that. And that is that men usually tend to believe more in conspiracy theories than women uh, throughout the Western world, with the sole exception being medical conspiracy theories, where there's usually not that many differences discernible. And QN and therefore seems to be tapping into another strategy to uh, make women um, make women believe that. Um, I was just remembering that I think the first time I really thought about the QAnon conspiracy theory was two years ago when I was contacted by an MA student from Freiburg who, was, who wanted to do his thesis on that and who wanted some advice and he proposed to do a gamification approach. And at the time back then that made complete sense because this seemed to be this rather harmless thing where people as you just described it are kind of plain make believe in these forums and uh, no one is really taking this 100% seriously um, because as you said everybody is pretending to be somebody somebody else there and of course um from today's perspective um this has changed um this really has changed a lot um but with regard to would you say then that uh, this is the mixture that is carrying the anti-corona protests in the United States that you just uh, described this uh, libertarian um, evangelical uh, alternative medicine um, QAnon brew? But, um, but, but it's, that, it's that cluster that are then joining with other existing conspiracy theory mm -hmm. groups, um, most of which revolve around the idea of um, 
liberty and anything that is seen as um, curtailing individual freedom is often regarded as some kind of vast government conspiracy. So you get existing conspiracy theorists who've had uh, you know, a focus on um, 5G, you get the anti-vaccination conspiracy theories, some of which are merely kind of vaccine hesitancy and are not full-blown conspiracy theories, but there are versions of that that, that are often uh, identified big pharma. Then you get um, uh, kind of forms of anti-Semitism that are often latching on to kind of the usual suspects like George Soros. And you get other groups um, uh, that are convinced that um, China is behind it all or that it is a kind of US government bioweapon. So I think what we're seeing is this, this kind of strange convergence of uh, different groups uh, coming together, most of which revolve around notions of um, uh, threats to individual freedom, the sense that the official version that we're being told is a lie and that most ordinary people are, are sheeple who are kind of um, stupidly following uh, government instructions. And all of these things are, uh, are, are quite familiar. Where, where, where do you see um, QAnon coming from? What, what other kind of sources or roots do you identify with that? Well, I think you've um, kind of um, talked about a couple of them already. I mean, on the one end of, I think we haven't mentioned Pizzagate yet, right? Which, of course, is um, like the pre-election version of that, uh, the accusation that the Democratic Party is running uh, a uh, child uh, pornography business uh, out of a pizza place in Washington, D.C., and that the menu is a coded uh, thing where you can order different uh, types of perversities, um, which is um, something that motivated a young man from Virginia to actually enter this pizza place, a weapon in hand and firing a couple of shots. And I think he's now in a federal prison and will be there for a very long time. And thank God nobody uh, was hurt. Um, so this would be one of the immediate sources, but of course we can trace this back for centuries, I think. I mean, one source, of course, would be anti-Semitic uh, conspiracy theories or um, maybe not full-blown conspiracy theories, but things that later became conspiracy theories that uh, revolve about uh, ritual murders of Christian children by Jews. Um, but at the same time, I think we can link this to 19th century accusation against Mormons and Catholics uh, that were always associated with sexual deviancy. And I think um, if we look at the history of the United States for a very long time, it is always the religious other that is uh, cast as uh, the conspiring force. And this only changes in the second half of the 20th century, where suddenly people who are not Christians at all become uh, the object of accusation. So suddenly it's uh, Muslims or it's Satanists. And I think we can trace back these uh, accusations that link uh, liberalism with Satanism to the 1960s. And since then they've in a way always been around and they've always merged with deep state accusations, which is why, why it's, I think this is why of the reasons why it's so incredibly difficult to really properly pull QAnon believe because it's so mixed up, as you explained, with uh, other conspiracy theories, different versions of the story that do not revolve around adrenochrome, this uh, mysterious thing that you can allegedly get from the blood of young children and that prolongs your, your life. So I think it's a very typical 21st century conspiracy theory in that it has so many different sources and picks up on so many different conspiracy theories theories that have been around for a long time. And of course, not everybody who would subscribe or self-identify as a QAnon believer believes in all of that. But people kind of cherry pick uh, certain elements and then ignore others. So, so why do you think QAnon has become the, one of the most prominent conspiracy theories of our time? 
Well, I think I would contest the view that it is one of the most prominent ones because I think even with 5%, it's still um, fairly marginal. I think it's so much talked about because it appears to be so completely absurd and because the accusations are so obviously wrong. I mean, for many people who have doubts about 9-11 or other things, uh, this is uh, just a bridge too far. This is something that they can't really believe and so they wonder why other people believe in that. I think it's extremely visible because we had these protesters uh, holding up cue signs at Trump uh, um, election rallies. And um, I think it's in a way the perfect conspiracy theory to project all your fears about conspiracy theory in general onto so um because it seems absolutely paranoid absolutely uh hysterical um as you said it has been linked to mass shootings and now to the storm storming of the capital so to violence to poisoning uh political discourse so i think uh people who worry about QAnon really worry very often about conspiracy theories in general but can't really put their finger on uh, what they find problematic about them in other cases. Yeah, I think one of the things with QAnon is the sense that people, that it's like a cult, it's a form of uh, millennial, a millenarial uh, kind of religious prophecy where all of the devoted followers are obsessively trying to decode the the sacred texts of of Q. And I think one of the things that people find from the outside um, so troubling about QAnon is the way that it functions in some ways like a cult. I think, you know, uh, Der Spiegel is, is not wrong to kind of think of it in terms of a cult. It's, it's particularly that idea that the QAnon believers seem to have become divorced from reality. And that that's the thing that you, you know, you can be uh, kind of, you can hold nine, some 9-11 or uh, Kennedy assassination conspiracy beliefs. And it seems like, you know, you're talking, you're talking about kind of the melting point of steel or you're talking about mm. bullet trajectories and it seems like it's within the realm of vaguely kind of you know sensible talk but QAnon seems to be so far removed from any sense of reality and particularly even now on on the very eve of the inauguration online QAnon supporters are still obsessively saying no no trust the plan it is it is all going to happen as as Q's um, predicted and whenever Q's predictions don't come to pass they immediately instead of correcting their views and losing faith in Q they just reinterpret um, come up with new prophecies uh, again and again. And that, that I think is one of the things that has captured uh, the attention of the media, um, particularly this idea of, um, you know, what, what do you do when a loved one has gone down the rabbit hole? And that's, that's something I, to me that feels that's changed from when we first started working on conspiracy theories and talking to the media about conspiracy theories. Normally people were interested in the Kennedy assassination or yep. moon landings, and it was just kind of a vague curiosity. But now increasingly I get asked by journalists, what's, what's, um, my, what's the advice that you would give to someone who has lost a loved one to a conspiracy cult like, like QAnon? And it feels like this is something that um, the media and the general public have become more concerned about. Yeah, I think that's um, definitely true here as well. I've answered this question so many times and I'm now um, putting into the chat, um, and Sabine, please pass this on to everybody because I, uh, it seems I can't, uh, the link to um, the guide that uh, our network produced on uh, what conspiracy theories are and how to deal with conspiracy theories, that um, this is really something people are um, 
interested in. And I mean, these are the most horrible emails I get, I have to say. So I get lots of emails from conspiracy theorists, uh, sometimes polite, sometimes rather polite, and sometimes outwardly aggressive. And it's gotten rougher and rougher over the past years of people who wrote to me, well, um, you're talking a lot of bullshit a year ago are now beginning their emails with you are a fascist, um, because they believe that it's 1933 again in Germany. Um, so, and I get, but I get lots of emails from people who ask me, well, my aunt, my sister, my father believes these things. How should I talk to this person? And um, the disconcerting answer, and you know that just as well as I, is that if somebody really believes in these things, there's very little you can do to actually um, make them unbelieve this. And uh, we know that one thing that you shouldn't do in most cases is actually uh, confront them with the facts and tell them, actually, this is a conspiracy theory, and this is all not true, and this is what's really true, because we know that this has at least the potential to make them believe in this conspiracy theory even more because they feel that their identity, which is so much tied to believe in conspiracy theories, um, is threatened and therefore they just outwardly um, reject that. So the question of course then is, um, how can one still talk to these people? Are there better strategies? Yeah, the strategy that seems worth employing first is some sense of some sense of, sense of empathy, uh, uh, you know, a recognition that these, these people are still human and um, that they um, feel deeply anguished about what's happening in the world. And so it's trying to find points of connection, even if the specific factual contents of their belief are so far beyond anything that you could remotely agree with. But you can recognize that, yes, they feel upset that um, uh, the country, in, in the case of the US or in Germany, is, is going in a direction that they that they don't agree with. You can kind of sympathize with their sense that, um, you know, they want to protect vulnerable children. Um, and there are, I think that would be the kind of, you know, one of the first most important things. That doesn't mean to say that you agree with them, but I think it's trying to recognize that um, often they are coming at this from, from a sense of anxiety and a, a sense of resentment um, about current affairs. And I think you can find points of um, common interest, common identity, particularly, you know, if it's someone you care about, you can recognize that you do still maybe share some ideas, some values in common, even if you have to steer clear of their, you know, um, the specific beliefs that they have. In the same way that some people with very strong religious beliefs can be, um, you know, hard to talk to if they feel that they uh, need to impose upon you their understanding of how everything works in the world and it can get quite uncomfortable but you can recognize even if you're not religious yourself that their religious beliefs come from often quite um, you know genuine moral um, uh, origins. The, for those of you um, watching this who read German, the Frankfurter Allgemeine Sonntagszeitung had a very good article on um, a couple, a couple of years back, uh, where the wife began to believe in all kinds of conspiracy theories. And the husband uh, really managed this quite well and eventually uh, helped her to get out of this. Uh, but of course, the article also brings to the fore that the final step, she had to take that herself. And um, because uh, she had to realize, no, this is in a way not leading anywhere and this is getting problematic because she was a part of a group that was concerned about chemtrails and they planned to go to the airport to actually uh, attack the pilots with laser pointers. And that was the moment where she said, oh, hang on a moment, this is not what I want to do. And so this triggered a moment of self-reflection. I think this is very important that um, empathy is one way to get there, but also maybe asking questions. Um, and this is, admittedly easier with uh, Corona conspiracy theories than with QAnon conspiracy theories. And this whole cultic thing about QAnon that you just described, this hasn't really spilled over to Germany, except for a very, very limited circle. 
Um, so the um, the reception of QN in, in among people who believe in Corona conspiracy theories in Germany has been more strategic, more rational. Like this is a hoax to achieve certain goals. And in a way, these uh, Corona conspiracy theorists are easier to talk to because you can ask them, I want to understand why you come to these conclusions. Uh, what are the sources that you're drawing on? And it's a very rationalistic conspiracy theory because they look at statistics. They quote uh, people who come with uh, often dubious, but at least not completely non-existent uh, academic credentials. Uh, they will point you to articles that they have found. And sometimes they are written by um, real scientists. So one can argue about that in a way. At least you can say, I want to understand why you believe this. And this um, questioning, I think, is also a good strategy that you just ask questions. You don't tell them this is a conspiracy theory, but you ask them, well, why do you find this piece of evidence uh, more convincing uh, than the one that, uh, that I would present you with? And then uh, you can have a discussion about that and maybe, maybe they um, will um, realize at one point that they are um, mistaken. But of course, there's never a guarantee for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another strategy that people have begun to explore recently is the idea of using the skepticism of conspiracy theorists back against their own beliefs. So you say, well, you know, you distrust everything, you question everything that, you know, uh, that's an honourable um, position to take. So let's employ some of that skepticism about your own beliefs. Where, you know, where, where did why would someone be putting forward this conspiracy theory? Where are, whose vested interests are served um, by the promotion of this conspiracy theory? So the kind of, exactly the kind of questions that conspiracy theorists are, ask uh, all the time about cui bono, who benefits? You can get conspiracy theorists to ask that about conspiracy theories that they believe in. And particularly, we know that a lot of conspiracy theories are promoted by conspiracy entrepreneurs, people who make often quite a decent living from sometimes quite cynically promoting conspiracy theories on um, uh, YouTube channels or selling merchandise, uh, giving talks, selling books and so on. Yeah, I have to say I'm um, I'm not sure um, how successful such a strategy would be because I mean one thing about conspiracy theorists, of course, is not that they are radically skeptical about everything. It's just that it's a mirror image of uh, people who don't believe in conspiracy theories because in a way we are very skeptical about uh, conspiracy theories and the people who promote them. But at the same time, of course, we trust other experts and we do that all the time because otherwise we couldn't live our life in a highly um, specialized uh, society. Uh, we have to trust doctors. We have to trust the mechanic who fixes our car. And we could ask another mechanic but uh, in, only in rare cases can we say, no, I'm, I'm going to do this myself. And conspiracy theorists, um, of course, always claim that they are extremely skeptical, but they're just skeptical about what they call mainstream science, mainstream sources. And at the same time, they have this blind faith in other authorities that we don't recognize as authorities. I'm like in Q, I think is the perfect example. Somebody, nobody knows who this guy is, if it is, if it is a guy or a couple of people or um, whatever claims, I have a security clearance, I'm an insider from uh, the Trump administration and I give you things and people tend to believe this because they want to believe what he's saying, I think. So um, I'm skeptical about um, turning this against them. But maybe we should talk about how one can deal with people who are not completely convinced by a conspiracy theory yet, who aren't true believers, but who might be drawn to a conspiracy theory. Are there other strategies to address these people? There are various things that social psychologists have been proposing, but we need to recognize that at the moment, there's very little concrete evidence in terms of which interventions work and which um, uh, don't. Probably more realistically is experience people have had working with radicalization and extremism and cults. The, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, experience in, in those kind of areas and that might in the context of 
the kind of rise of QAnon in the US might be more relevant, particularly after tomorrow, um, hopefully with the inauguration of Joe Biden, there is going to be a lot of QAnon supporters who are suddenly thinking, but, but we trusted the plan and the plan has never happened. So how do you bring those, those people back or people who might be kind of um, not diehard QAnon supporters, but who felt there was something to it? Well, um, some of the strategies that people have uh, suggested are things like um, pre-bunking. So the, the social psychology research suggests if you wait until you people's beliefs are um, firmly entrenched, it can be very hard to change people's minds by giving uh, fact-checking corrections. Instead, and uh, the corona crisis might be an interesting example of this. The theory goes that if you provide people in advance with information about the kinds of misinformation that they're likely to encounter and why those forms of misinformation are, uh, are not accurate, that means that they are inoculated, to use the metaphor. Which is a problematic they, metaphor. Yeah, you know, uh, for when they do encounter the, the misinformation, and that makes it more likely uh, that they will be skeptical about the, the misinformation when they get it, rather than um, debunking that doesn't seem to work. Personally, I, you know, I know that that has worked in a lab setting, but the effects uh, are very short lived. Um, and so in kind of real world practical situations where we never know in advance what exactly, exactly which conspiracy theories and pieces of misinformation are going to emerge. And we have no realistic way to somehow inoculate uh, the vast um, masses of people who are going to receive this, this misinformation. Um, to me, it seems quite a, quite a long um, uh, stretch. But what, yep. Michael, what, what do you what do you think? Yeah, I'm work? I'm also somewhat skeptical about debunking specific arguments from from specific conspiracy theories. But I think that actually educating people about conspiracy theories in general, what they are, how they tend to argue, why people believe in them, uh, what their usual strategies are, I think that works. Um, and I think we have an historical example that this works because um, if we look at what happened to conspiracy theories in the US, something that Katharina Thalmann, who of course also was a student at Freiburg, um, who some people watching this uh, will know and they will remember her, has, uh, the, she has traced this in her book on the stigmatization of conspiracy theories that is actually the popularization of insights from the social sciences and people um, learning about uh, what psychology and political science and sociology can tell them about how politics works, how society works, how human beings operate, that this had uh, was a major factor in moving conspiracy theories from, as she argues, from the mainstream of American society to the margins at the end of the 50s and the early 60s. So I think uh, the best thing to address uh, conspiracy theories is really invest in, um, in education. And uh, one of the um, few upsides of uh, the past year and this high visibility of conspiracy theories in Germany has been that um, many politicians have become aware of that. So. Um, I'm part of a couple of committees that advise the Bavarian parliament and others. Um, and um, I think that conspiracy theories will make it into um, um, the curriculum of schools very soon at different levels. And I think that this will have an effect because I, I don't think that we're hardwired to believe in conspiracy theories. I mean, there are these people who take these evolutionary approaches and say, well, we're hardwired to believe in conspiracy theories. But I think we're kind of instinctively drawn to conspiracy theories because we've learned to uh, link events that occur after each other as cause and effect um, and to um, recognize patterns in a specific way. And so we, I think we're all inst uh, instinctively drawn in this, to a certain degree to conspiracy theories. But once we've learned about different models um, 
different ways of explaining uh, social reality, um, I think we will be more skeptical about conspiracy theories. And this, I think, is something people can be taught about. Mm. I think one of the things that we're beginning to see schools and education ministries becoming more interested in is um, digital media literacy. You know, it's a lot of the discussion around corona conspiracy theories and QAnon conspiracy theories is the way that they circulate virally online, particularly on social media. And so I'm involved in a couple of projects to produce um, training materials for mm. teachers um, to tr uh, to kind of deal with the problem of conspiracy theories in school. And that problem of how to um, inoculate yourself against conspiracy theories is closely connected with becoming more digitally literate and understanding the kind of manipulations and seductions of social media. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I've done a lot of teacher training sessions over the past uh, years here in Germany, and uh, I just sent around the link uh, to the education section on our website where we've collected so much material that can be used in schools at different levels. It's also there in different languages. And I mean, one of the things that I did that was most fun was um, a project I did with um, uh, students here in Tübingen who uh, want to become teachers. So we looked at the loose change films um, and we analyzed 20 minutes from one of them um, really, really closely, basically second by second, and uh, to see what the strategies are. And this is, can be downloaded from the website. And uh, it was really eye-opening for the students because they basically did what conspiracy theorists do only in reverse. So um, they uh, did a, um, an image search backward uh, on Google and saw that the images that are used, they aren't really from plane crashes, but they're, they're from different contexts. And they uh, did research on the temperature at which steel melts and all of that. And then you realize it's all irrelevant because a, tr a plane obviously isn't made out of steel. It would never fly if it was solid steel. And you learn how to disprove these things and suddenly you could go further and further and risk for them like uh, they said well now I realize uh, why people find conspiracy theories attractive because we just did it the other way the other way around and this is something I think that can be replicated with students at school either using the material that we have provided or doing the analysis themselves so um, there are ways to um, counter conspiracy theories and of course uh, something that we shouldn't forget and um, maybe then we can open um uh, the discussion to, to the audience is that conspiracy theories can be dangerous, they can be have very harmful effects, we know that, but there are also um, great fun and good entertainment and many people just uh, like to engage with them because it's um, it's fun to imagine that the Illuminati are ruling the world for two hours or read a book about that and I think this is what um, got us into this topic in the very first place, um, as well a fascination with the narrative quality, the aesthetic quality of, um, of the phenomenon that we've discussed and that looks so bleak now these days sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Shall we open it up to yes, the please. public? All right. Thank you, first of all, to the two of you for this very insightful conversation. And also thank you for the audience because I received quite a few questions. <laughs> so um, please forgive me if uh, one or the other question will not be posed uh, now. I'm trying to, um, yeah, to fit in as many questions as possible. All right. I would suggest we start with um, a, rather general question um, about uh, Americans. So are Americans just inherently more susceptible, susceptible to conspiracy theories? In other words, are cultural and educational experiences specific to Americans that make them more susceptible to tolerating, believing, and spreading conspiracy theories when compared to individuals from other countries? Moreover, this is interesting, is it contagious? Could this susceptibility spread to other countries? 
Shall I, shall I go first? Yes, you can go first. Okay. Then I'll correct um, you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, two important things here. The first is to notice um, that conspiracy beliefs are common in many countries around the world. And depending on how you measure it, in terms of kind of um, percentage of believers or in terms of actual influence on politics, we could argue that actually other countries are far more prone to conspiracy thinking and conspiracy thinking has far more effect in countries like um, uh, in, in, in parts of the Middle East or if we think historically, obviously, um, kind of Nazi Germany, Stalin's Russia and so on. So that's you know the one of the things we need to kind of bear in mind that the U.S. does not have a monopoly on conspiracy theories, and in many ways, um, conspiracy theories play less of a role in the U.S. compared to some, some other countries. Um, but there's another way of answering that question, which is to think about some of the specifics of American history and American political ideology that make conspiracy theories um, part of US culture. So we can think about the Puritan heritage of the US, this idea of uh, a Puritan mindset that interprets everything that happens literally uh, uh, through the, the Bible. Um, that seems to be hardwired into the, the US mindset. We can also recognize a strong strand of individualism at the heart of American political ideology that has run right through to the present. We can also recognize uh, the strand of anti-elitism that is baked into American political ideology. All of these things are visible in other countries, but I think that particular cluster of beliefs around um, uh, kind of um, Puritanism, Republicanism, uh, individualism, anti-elitism give uh, the US uh, a, a quite particular strand of conspiracy thinking. So Michael, what, what's, what's the right answer? Um, I mean, um, I feel um, in a way the answer you've given is uh, at least partly the answer that I gave in um, my book on American conspiracy theories, which where you see how things have changed because uh, there everybody I think still felt the need, you need to explain why Americans are so drawn to conspiracy theories. And um, in a way, I think everything that you said is true, but then I would say, well, that goes, the same goes basically for, um, for Great Britain. I mean, that's where the Puritans came from and where we had Republicanism as well and also more individualism than in other countries. So it seems to me that if we look at the past, um, conspiracy theories uh, probably in the US weren't that much more popular, if at all, than in uh, Germany in the 18th, 19th century or in England or in other parts of um, other parts of Europe. They are, of course, in the present now. So we know that about a third of Germans seems to be drawn to conspiracy theories, whereas in the US, and I just um, sent the link around, uh, we have good studies that show that uh, every second American believes in at least one conspiracy theory. So it seems to, and I've been thinking about that uh, a lot in, in the past one or two years. And I think there's a couple of reasons why that might be the case. And I think one is education. We know that uh, the propensity to believe in conspiracy theories decreases with the degree of education. And I think all the statistics that are done by the United Nations on German people in Germany, for example, tend to be better educated than Americans on average. Secondly, um, we know from psychology that people who are drawn to conspiracy theories um, in the present are people uh, who feel powerless, who feel that they don't have control over things. And um, interestingly enough, if you look at the 1990s, the earliest quantitative studies, African-Americans tend to believe more in conspiracy theories than white Americans, um, which reflected their historical experience. By now that difference has gone and uh, Trump is kind of the result of that. But I think if you compare Americans with um, Germans where uh, there is a better social security system um, um, and a couple of other things in place, then on the whole Germans feel um, not as 
much without power as many Americans feel, and therefore maybe more Americans believe in conspiracy theories. And I think finally, um, um, the political system plays a role in that, of course, polarization, um, I think, also drives belief in conspiracy theories. And if you look at the American political system, it's very competitive. You have only two parties. The winner takes it all. The parties are becoming more and more extreme. And in a way, you don't see um, the, your opponent only as someone who has a who differs from you in uh, certain political views, like McCain talking about Obama so famously during the 2008 campaign, but you tend to think about your political opponent as an enemy and therefore uh, you um, find it more and more likely that your enemies are conspiring against you and are stealing the election. Whereas in Germany, you have a political system that is built on coalition, on cooperation, on consensus to a certain degree, and your political opponent is, your, is tomorrow partner and I think therefore um, th what happens between the two major parties in the US in Germany only happens between all the established parties and the alternative for Germany um, and therefore um, I think Americans uh, tend to believe more in conspiracy theories than other people but I completely agree with you if we go to Turkey if we go to Russia if we go to uh, many places in the Arab world conspiracy theories are far more important than uh, far more widespread than they are in the in the US. I saw a statistic today that uh, more than 95% of uh, Fidesz voters in Hungary believe that George Soros is orchestrating a global conspiracy against uh, the country. And uh, about 40% of Hungarians believe that the 9-11 attacks were staged by the US government. And that was the lowest answer in that poll. So, um, because they don't really care about apparently what's happening abroad. So in Hungary, conspiracy theories are far more uh, widespread and important uh, when it comes to politics than they are in the US. Okay, thank you for, for this uh, uh, explanation. Um, then we have a question about the organization of QAnon and such groups. So the question is, is there a person or multiple people behind this who are organizing all of this and decide what to add and what not? Or is it sort of like Wikipedia, where everyone just adds another point or part to the theory? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, so in terms of who Q actually is, it's, it's probably uh, more than one person. Um, there are various kind of plausible theories going around, one of which is that it's uh, Ron Watkins, who's the son of the uh, kind of founder of 4chan. Um, there's also a guy from South Africa who seems to have certainly been Q at, at some point, um, but definitely Q is not a high ranking uh, intelligence insider. But the thing that I think is really interesting about that question is, well, is there kind of an organization behind QAnon as a, as a kind of conspiracy theory political grouping. And my view would be no, that actually what's in one of the most interesting things about it is that is a, it's, it's almost a crowdsourced form of collective religious interpretation. Um, that that's a large part of the appeal of it is endlessly uh, interpreting these um, cryptic drops by by Q, and that often the these don't converge into one single um, canonical um, theory. That there are competing branches. So, for example, there are those who are convinced that um, JFK Jr. never died in a plane crash in the late 1990s, but is still alive. And at one point, the theory was that he was going to, at the last moment, um, replace Pence as Trump's uh, veep when um, uh, the, the kind of Biden was going to get overthrown with the imposition of martial law. Other people within the Q community, QAnon community, were saying, no, that's absolute madness. We don't believe that. And so there are kind of been like, like all religious groupings, there are kind of all political um, uh, movements, there are factions. Um, 
But, and this is when I'm going to begin to sound like a conspiracy theorist, I think we always need to think about whether there are um, influential uh, right-wing funders behind various um, political actions happening in the US. I doubt it with QAnon, but certainly um, that kind of intersection between QAnon and Stop the Steal seems to have traces of, uh, and also kind of anti-lockdown protests seem to have been, in, seem to have received kind of significant funding from uh, the usual kind of um, right-wing um, uh, funding uh, uh, groups. What, what's your take on it, Michael? Actually, I think I leave it at that because you are far more into that than I am. So um, <laughs> as I said, Q is um, kind of a fringe thing in Germany and I've been very much focused on um, populism and conspiracy theory in, um, in Europe in the past year and Corona conspiracy theory. So I would never doubt your authority, <laughs> authority on that. But I would agree with that, that at the way, if you look at how the Q and thing started, it seems very, very unlikely that if uh, somebody wanted to influence public opinion through that, that they would start it like that on 4chan. And so, so it, I think it took a lot of lucky or unlucky coincidences to move out of that realm and um honestly i still think without these um these shootings and corona um it would still be very much a fringe thing and uh but then of course people believe that the corona thing has been planned so um there you go okay great thank you um there is a question about um academics actually and uh, this question is i would be interested to know if uh, the two of you uh, know any fellow academic who is justifying any um, of the QAnon theories and is trying to give the movement an intellectual foundation, and if so, how how the hell actually that person wrote? What is James Tracy doing? <laughs> so, so you know, there, there have been. Uh, over the years, various examples of academics who uh, have shown sympathy to conspiracy theories. Obviously, kind of, you know, in the 1970s, it was perhaps more plausible for academics to be interested in Kennedy assassination conspiracy theories and so on, less likely now. But Michael and I know uh, several academics who have kind of, you know, greater or lesser sympathy at the moment, I haven't come across any academics um, who've shown uh, any kind of serious um, uh, belief in QAnon conspiracy theories. I think um, partly because, you know, they're just such um, uh, kind of bizarre uh, uh, ideas. Um, I can't imagine that um, there would be many, particularly once QAnon began to get in the spotlight in the US with the mass shootings, there is no way that an academic would be able to even remotely endorse a QAnon conspiracy theory and keep their job. I can't, you know, they would be, even, you know, with, even with um, uh, academic freedom and tenure, um, it's, uh, you know, they would be very quickly uh, removed. Yeah, and it's because it's, uh, as Peter said, it's more, in many ways, more like a cult than really a conspiracy theory, unlike other conspiracy theories. If you look at certain 9-11 conspiracy theories or a coronavirus conspiracy theories, they're very rationalistic, as we discussed earlier. So there you actually have quite a considerable number of academics who are pushing these things. And I mean, in Germany, we've had... Um, people like Zukarit Bhakti uh, pushing coronavirus conspiracy theories and other people doing this. So, um, but with QAnon, um, no, in Germany, of course not. Okay, interesting. Um, I would like to also uh, get into um, the current situation. And there is a question that um, yeah, is very interesting with when we look at uh, also the storm of the US Capitol, for example, um, even though it's a bit um, more general, question is, what is the role of racism in the QAnon movement? Has QAnon also gained momentum as a reaction to the, the Black Lives Matter movement? 
And are people believing, are people believing the QAnon conspiracy theory in Germany also extreme right political group supporters? You take so the first it. part. Yeah, yeah, I'll take the first part. Um, so we obviously need to recognize that QAnon comes out of 4chan culture, which is really nasty. Um, it's uh, anti-Semitic, it's uh, racist, um, violently homophobic. So, you know, most of the early QAnon conspiracy theories are very were very much directed about um, uh, um, capturing and executing Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. Um, once QAnon leaves that 4chan culture, and particularly when it becomes um, taken up by evangelical Christians and particularly women, I think it loses um, some of that kind of initial uh, culture. But it's, as we were mentioning before, it's about that idea of the intersection between QAnon and other adjacent conspiracy theories. So the, the proud, you know, uh, groups, uh, militia groups like um, the Proud Boys and the, um, uh, and the Boogaloo, all of these kind of various forms of uh, kind of neo-fascist uh, groups in the US that are explicitly white supremacist. And I think that um, QAnon and the kind of um, um, stop the steal election conspiracy theories have in many cases set themselves up in kind of direct opposition to Black Lives Matter. It's, it becomes this item of faith for um, kind of that form of white, uh, kind of a normalization of white supremacism. Well, in Germany, QAnon has, of course, also been picked up by people on the extreme right, by what we refer to as the new right. Um, but um, if we look at the corona um, protests, uh, most people who are protesting there self-identify either as left-wing or as uh, moderates, people who are in the middle but just don't feel represented by, um, by any particular uh, party. So that's about 60 to 70% of the people who are on the streets there. And so the people who really self-identify as being right or extreme right is uh, relative Relatively, relatively small. But then, as I said, the, the reception of QAnon in Germany is very different from what's happening in the US, at least in when it comes beyond very, very, very small circles. It's not that cultic. It's more about drawing on, well, that's what Q is saying about the deep state and what Q is saying about Corona. Um, the problematic thing that is happening in Germany at the moment, and Q is only part of, of that with these protests, is that we see a growing radicalization of the protests. And the Verfassungsschutz described this as a new form of radicalization, which I think is um, quite, uh, quite accurate. And the problem is that you have these people coming from rather left-wing positions uh, and they really believe that it is 1933 again. So there are people who I've been observing online for a couple of years who really think that in the next year they will be given the option either to go into the gas or to get vaccinated. And uh, all these comparisons that have disturbed so many of us in the recent months with Anne Frank and Sophie Scholl, uh, from their perspective, that makes perfect sense because they think it's 1933 again and this is the beginning of a new dictatorship. And the problem is if the Nazis are those above who are imposing these measures, then the Nazis can't be those who are marching with you on the streets, especially since these people from the new right don't look like Nazis anymore, but they, um, uh, they're not skinheads. Hats. They're not wearing these uh, boots, but they look very different. And the thing with the new right in Germany also is that uh, they have long discarded any positive reference to the Third Reich and to Nazi Germany, because they realized that beyond the very narrow group of people, you can't really win there. So what they're trying to do is that they try to paint Nazi Germany as a left-wing thing because it was national socialism. 
And they try to paint the Federal Republic of Germany as the natural successor of Nazi Germany. So they also talk of a dictatorship. So you have these people coming from the left talking about a dictatorship and you have these people from the right doing this strategically. And this is why we see this mixture on the streets in Germany at the moment, which um, is still too small to really cause harm to German democracy, but uh, still would need to be, would need to be monitored. Thank you. Very interesting, um, this perspective. So since we are kind of running out of time, if you would be okay with this, I would ask one last question. It's actually two questions kind of fitting together um, about the current situation and also sort of an outlook. Um, so uh, here are the two questions. Um, the movement is explicitly linked, so QAnon, um, is explicitly uh, linked to Donald Trump and his present uh, presidency, um, depicting him as some kind of messiah. Um, so what is your assessment? Will QAnon live maybe long past Donald Trump's term, um, which is officially ending tomorrow with the inauguration of Joe Biden? And then the second question um, that fits um, this is, do you think the QAnon situation will get worse in the next years? And could members get more aggressive? And should we be scared or prepared um, for attacks like terrorist attacks? My, my genuine answer is, I really don't know. Um, uh, my suspicion is that actually for Q, QAnon is not gonna disappear immediately in the US at all. There are some people saying um, there are gonna be a lot of people waking up um, and smelling reality tomorrow when Biden is inaugurated. No, these people have long since left any understanding of uh, ordinary rea reality. They will continue to interpret what happens through the lens of QAnon. They will see the Biden presidency as illegitimate and will continue to it has become overtaken or kind of part of a much larger story of um, that the election was stolen, that in inter that in turn is part of a much larger story that kind of white working class, um, God-fearing, gun-loving America is in peril. And that is ultimately, I think, what we're talking about in a lot of cases, that this is a deep-rooted ideological, but also social and economic sense of resentment, grievance, a sense that um, the world that, uh, of privilege, uh, of kind of, you know, white privilege is um, beginning to come to an end in the US and a lot of people will fight against that tooth, or nail, tooth and nail because it is very much in their sense of identity of what America means to them. So in that sense I think QAnon in terms there will still be a hardcore group of QAnon believers who will continue to um, obsessively uh, interpret the world through through that lens. But in terms of that wider grouping um, of people who see the world through the lens of grievance conspiracy theories and the connection of that to uh, white supremacism, that's um, only going to get worse, particularly um, because of the power of social media. I think that um, that combination of factors means that these things are not going to disappear overnight in the US. Yeah, I would completely agree. I, and I also think that this process is already underway, where basically um... QAnon is no longer the most current chapter in this longer story of a plot against the people, but is becoming the penultimate chapter, which is, I think, the same that 
of uh, the same is going to happen to to corona conspiracy theories and we talked about this that they in most cases they weren't new but they were just added to existing conspiracy theories about 5g vaccination whatever and at some point and people ask me that about corona conspiracy theories all the time um once the pandemic is over are they going to disappear yes and no because uh, they will become like the penultimate chapter but people will come up with something new and i think in the us in particular um, what we can add to social media that driving that is, of course, uh, what is going to happen with the Republican Party, because yeah. um, Trump may be gone. We don't really know what he's going to do um, in the next couple of years. But Trumpism will not disappear because the model has uh, uh, proven to be far too successful. Without the corona crisis, Trump probably would have won re-election fairly easily and um, more people voted for him than for any other Republican candidate in the history history of the country. So um, it's very, very unlikely that um, the party will completely turn around and uh, pursue a different type of politics from tomorrow onward on, but there will be uh, the major contenders will try to copy Trump, I think, and they will um, use these conspiracy theories in the way Trump used them over the past years. If they are as successful as he was for a while, I don't know, but uh, this is not going to go away. There's a slim chance that we might be in a similar historical moment to the end of McCarthyism mm -hmm. in the 1950s, that moment in the House and American Activities Committee hearings where uh, the famous phrase, you know, have you no shame? And I think we're, we're beginning to see some of that in the Republican Party. Some people have um, uh, kind of woken up to the dangers of Trumpism with the storming of the Capitol and have felt that actually we've let this go too far. So I'm hopeful um, that we might be at that kind of similar historical moment of uh, a complete shift. But at the moment, it doesn't seem to be nearly uh, as strong as it needs to be to, to move away from Trumpism. I would agree. Okay. Well, then uh, I guess it would be a good idea to put it in the curriculum um, of schools and everything to, to get um, to know how to debunk, pre-bunk, um, yeah, conspiracy theories, because it seems we kind of have to live with them and uh, new forms of conspiracy theories. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Knight and Professor Butter. This was very insightful, and I'm sure that we could have talked uh, for days and days about this topic. Um, and I'm sure we will continue um, this conversation um, because as we said, it's not um, gonna go away. Um, since we were already speaking about the um, inauguration um, tomorrow, I also wanted to point out that we will have a talk on um, the inauguration by um, the former um, editor-in-chief of Spiegel and a contributor to Die Zeit now, Klaus Brinkbäumer, who will um, talk about the inauguration and analyze um, the inauguration actually right after it happened. It starts at uh, 7 p.m. Um, and uh, I think in Germany it will start at 6 p.m. So you will be more or less live. Um, I will share the link um, for the registration in, um, oh, sorry, um, in the chat. Um, so that if you're interested to join us, um, please do. Um, we would be happy to, to have a lot of you. Um, and I thank you for being here tonight and uh, listening and joining, um, listening to and joining this conversation. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you and uh, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.